Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Courtney Friedman. Coming up tonight, tomorrow, more businesses across the state will be able to operate in the next phase of the governor's reopen Texas plan. The superintendent of San Antonio Independent School District will be joining us live to talk about how schools will move forward from this public health crisis. Plus, tonight we head to Kinney County, a Texas county with no COVID-19 cases. But first, one more COVID-19 related death reported in Bear County today. That brings our death toll to 54. There are now 1,805 confirmed COVID-19 cases in Bear County. 42 of the new cases came from the community, one from a jail inmate and one from a jail staff member. San Antonio Metro Health Director Don Emmerich acknowledged numbers are still going up, but explained why the city is not alarmed at this point because they are looking at several different factors when assessing the situation. Yes, these numbers are going up a little bit, but is the hospital numbers going up? Are the ventilator numbers going up? Are EMS reports going up? Is our positivity rate going up? Um, and all of that, the answer to all of those is no. So, so we're okay. As testing expands to more people here in the Alamo City, public health officials say the positivity rate continues to decline. Right now, they say that number is just under 7%. Testing recently expanded to asymptomatic people in marginalized communities and communities of color. Dr. Don Emmerich with Metro Health, you just heard from her, says they realized testing was an obstacle for so many. The more that we test, the more that that number will come down. We want to try to eliminate as many barriers as possible. Today, two new mobile sites opened at Las Palmas Library parking lot in Woodlawn Park. Both sites saw a large crowd of people hoping to be tested. New tonight, we have learned that after exhausting every option, Visit San Antonio is furloughing nearly half of its staff members. That's 40 out of 82 workers. Visit San Antonio is the public-private partnership that promotes tourism and conventions in our city. A spokesperson for the organization released a statement today calling the move painful, saying this furlough takes effect on Monday and will likely last through July 31st. Of course, the pandemic has dealt a devastating blow to retail and tourism industries. In a normal year, San Antonio's travel and tourism industry supports about 140,000 jobs and contributes more than $213 million in taxes and fees to the city. We're told it would happen, and it has. Today, the Bear County Sheriff's Office released crime numbers showing reports of family violence had dropped 22% during this pandemic. Experts predicted the drop as victims are stuck at home with abusers, unable to leave and call for help. Sheriff Javier Salazar called the drop in reports a false sense of security, and he explains why the community's eyes and ears are more important now than ever before. It's part of my series confronting domestic violence, loving and fear. From March 3rd to April 25th, during the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic, a 22% drop in domestic violence reports in Bear County. But experts, advocates, and Sheriff Javier Salazar call the number artificially down. It's still going on, it's just in the shadows. And that's the most tragic thing. A stay home order keeps victims locked inside with their abuser with no excuse to leave and ask for help. Abusers being masters at deception, masters at manipulation, Think about it. They've got in, in, in some households 24 seven access to that uh, victim where they're just constantly berating and victimizing and getting inside his or her head and, and really just tying their tying their mind up in knots. Uh, so think about it. all that's got to be undone before this person can get to the point where they can outcry. He says it's what keeps him and other law enforcement officers up at night, knowing the abuse is happening, but they don't know where. So he's asking neighbors, family, friends, even delivery workers to pay attention and report any unusual activity, even if you're not positive. You may be that lifeline. And before you think, well, I'd feel silly if it's nothing to it. I don't want to waste the, the, the sheriff's office's time. Uh, I'm going to feel dumb if it's if if I call and I, I stirred up all this trouble for nothing. You can be anonymous. You can absolutely be anonymous. I'd matter of fact, I'd urge that. Think about uh, what could happen if you didn't call and tragedy strikes and a, a child is, is killed or scarred forever uh, and you didn't call. 
If you see or hear anything, call the sheriff's office at 210-335-6000 or SAPD's non-emergency number at 210-207-7273. You can also email bcsotips at bear.org. Again, you can remain anonymous. If you're in doubt or have a bad feeling, make the call. Let's take a look at the number of COVID-19 cases statewide now. There are 35,000 cases in Texas and 973 deaths. So far, 455,000 people have been tested. 217 of 254 counties are reporting cases. The rural community of Kinney County has yet to confirm a single case of COVID-19. The county judge points to a quick response to the pandemic and its close-knit community. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how the county is preparing for any possible incoming cases. We're just very blessed and, and fortunate to where we don't have any cases. As schools remain closed and classes have gone online at Bracket ISD in Kinney County, staff wanted to show appreciation to their educators. Thanks for everything you do for us. Our community has worked really hard at uh, prevention uh, strategies to help our, our members of the community uh, protect themselves. Well, we are small, and I do think that that does play a little bit into why we do have zero. Uh, but I think this community is really very caring and very caring about each other. About 3,600 people live in Kinney County. Last weekend, the National Guard set up a pop-up test site at the county civic center. 38 people were tested. They weren't all from Kinney County, but every Kinney County resident who was tested uh, last Saturday a week ago tested negative. County Judge Tully Shahan says this is the only location where people have been able to get tested in the county. He says there is only one clinic in Kinney County and the nearest hospitals are in Del Rio or Eagle Pass. The county judge says when they first heard about the coronavirus, local leaders, law enforcement, school officials and businesses got together to plan out how they were going to handle it. We started putting out a flyer once a week to all of the people in Kenny County on what to do, what not to do, who to contact if they get sick. The county judge says it's been a community effort that's kept them safe. All of our churches, all of the businesses, the larger businesses in Kenny County shut down immediately. With no cases reported so far, Shahan says they are still preparing. We are stockpiling uh, PPE. We're stockpiling masks. We've been very blessed with good people cooperating together for the nine, Tiffany Huertas. And on Monday, May 11th, the National Guard will be testing again at the Kinney County Civic Center. Back here at home, local leaders are starting to make public how they plan to use the money they received from the Federal CARES Act. The city of San Antonio received $270 million, Bear County $79 million. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg says city council has outlined a strategy that will prioritize keeping people in their homes. Their strategy also includes plans to retrain workers for a post COVID-19 economy. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf also listed similar priorities for the county's funds. Here's how the county plans break down. Priority one will be retraining the workforce. Second priority will be household stabilization and support. Third, combating the digital divide and fourth, business support. The county also has elections to worry about, more specifically, making sure our elections during a pandemic are conducted safely. As you know, elections coming up on July 17th, I think it is for the runoff elections. And uh, we uh, are now uh, in, in a bit of a debate over what to do about the mail-in ballot. The runoff elections are a little more than two months away. Now let's turn to the nine at nine. An arrest has been made in yesterday's fatal barbershop stabbing. Hog farmers forced to get rid of perfectly good stock and two kids scare off a would be burglar. Here's tonight's nine at nine. 42 year old Damian Terrell Campbell is in San Antonio police custody in connection with the stabbing death of a barbershop employee. The victim has been identified by the medical examiner as 20 year old Evan O'Regan. Police and friends, though, have referred to her as a transgender woman with the name of Helly O'Regan. The arrest affidavit states Campbell choked O'Regan until she was unconscious and then stabbed her repeatedly. Police say Campbell also stabbed another employee who was able to get away and call for help. Campbell is charged with murder. The search is over for a swimmer in the Guadalupe River after rescue crews found his body today. He was identified as 18-year-old Adrian Mares. 
He was swimming with family members at the FM 1117 bridge last night. The family says he and another man began struggling to swim. We got a lot of brush under underwater that you can't see. Um, there's a lot of whirlpools. Um, there's a night, there's a pretty good bend in the river, not a, quite a 90 degree bend just down from here. And uh, it causes a lot of currents, uh, a lot of undertows. And, and so it just makes it really, really dangerous once you get into deeper water. The other swimmer made it out safely. The Department of Justice is dropping the criminal case against Trump's first national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Flynn is accused of lying about his contacts with Russia, which prompted Trump to fire him three years ago. A district court must still formally approve the request. The Justice Department says it cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Flynn lied. 33-year-old Gloricia Woody is arrested and accused of shooting and injuring McDonald's workers in Oklahoma City. Police say Woody entered the dining area despite it being closed. When workers asked her to leave, she refused and got into a scuffle with one of them. They say workers eventually forced her outside, but she went back in with a handgun and fired about three rounds. One worker was shot in the arm, two others hit by shrapnel. The COVID-19 pandemic is impacting one part of the food supply chain. A Minnesota family-owned hog farm has not been able to send pigs to market. They normally send about 700 pigs a week, but now they have 3,500 ready to go, but nowhere to send them. The farmers are planning to euthanize most, if not all of the pigs. We put down sick pigs because you feel sorry for them. But have a healthy pig to take a break from shooting. The farmers are making room for the 3,000 baby pigs they also have. After widespread outrage, Frontier Airlines is dropping a new program to charge customers $39 to keep the middle seat next to them open on flights. The pricing option announced Monday was set to begin tomorrow. The reversal follows criticism from lawmakers that the airline was profiting from the pandemic. The airline's CEO claims their goal was to give customers the option for more space. Hong Kong Customs made a record-breaking seizure of dried shark fins. More than 57,000 pounds of fins were taken from about 38,000 endangered sharks. The value priced at about $1.1 million. A 57-year-old man was arrested in connection with the illegal shipment. He could face up to 10 years in jail if convicted. Watch this and listen to the screams that would send anyone running. That's the sound of two kids defending their home against an attempted burglar in Utah. Their mom says she got an alert on her phone when the camera sensed motion. The suspect saw the open garage and tried to go inside, but was scared away by the 12 and 9-year-old siblings. The family gave the video to police, which helped lead to an arrest of two suspects. A group in Indiana wanting to show some patriotic pride has made a big artistic statement. Justin Riggins, with some help, painted a 10,000 square foot flag on his field. Using 30 gallons of paint, it took about two hours to complete. Riggins says he's very patriotic and wanted to honor heroes on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. He plans to leave the mural in the field all year long for others to enjoy. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Good evening, I'm meteorologist Katie Blake, and after a very comfortable day yesterday, things started to feel a bit more humid out there on your Thursday, but our next round of changes are right around the corner. Yes, right around the corner, as in tomorrow. Our next cold front arrives Friday afternoon. That will set us up for a cooler Mother's Day weekend, and while there will be more clouds on Saturday, things look much more sunny and pleasant by Mother's Day. You're going to like the forecast. So tonight while we're sleeping, this cold front that arrives tomorrow will be moving through north and central Texas. By dawn tomorrow morning, it'll be getting closer to the hill country, but I expect it to be in San Antonio right about lunchtime tomorrow, maybe even as soon as 11 a.m. As this frontal boundary moves through San Antonio, there will be a chance of an isolated shower, better chance of a shower or non-severe storm down on the coastal bend. Friday afternoon as that frontal boundary continues to move south. Unfortunately, this is not going to be a big rainmaker for us, and we do need the rain. What I think you'll notice the most about this front tomorrow is the strong north wind that kicks in behind it. So tonight, our wind direction will be out of the south, but tomorrow around midday, as that frontal boundary moves through, our wind direction will shift around to the north, and then wind speeds will really start to increase. So by the middle of the afternoon tomorrow, we're looking at sustained winds 15 to 25 miles per hour. 
but not pictured here are our wind gusts. Those could be as high as 35, 40 miles per hour at times Friday afternoon and Friday evening. Finally, late Friday night into Saturday, winds will start to relax. So a strong north wind on Friday, but that's gonna help to usher in some cooler air. We'll see our afternoon high temperatures fall into the mid 70s on Saturday with some cloud cover, then more sun on Sunday, but it'll still be a touch on the cooler side with high temperatures for your Mother's Day in the low 80s. Overall, Sunday is gonna be a really nice day. So if you'll be out early tomorrow, it'll still be warm, it will still be muggy, but the changes will arrive right about midday when that frontal boundary moves on through. So we'll top out near 80 right around lunchtime and then see temperatures fall through the 70s into the afternoon, eventually all the way into the 50s by early Saturday morning. So Saturday will keep some clouds around, also a low chance of an early shower. And then on Sunday, skies will really clear out and it's just going to be a very pleasant, comfortable day to celebrate mom on Sunday. Early next week, really by Tuesday, things will start to feel a lot more muggy again. And we could also see some isolated thunderstorms move into South Texas on Tuesday. Once humidity cranks up Tuesday of next week, it will stay high through Wednesday and Thursday. Thank you, Katie. Stay with us, we'll be back in a minute. If fighting fear with facts, it's what we're attempting to do every night during this pandemic at around the same time. And tonight we're joined by SAISD Superintendent Pedro Martinez. He has a huge school district to deal with and something that uh, really you haven't had to deal with before, I'm guessing, is a pandemic and exactly how you deal with it. Thank you for joining us tonight, Mr. Martinez. Thank you for having me. We talked about this a little bit at six and I want to bring it up again and it's been a question that we've been getting is is what have you learned having to adapt to a pandemic? Obviously, there's no manual on how you deal with something like this. You know, I just been so impressed with how our community has come together, the leadership of, of our mayor and, and our county judge to keep us safe. Uh, our teachers are the heroes. You know, they've been they in weeks created uh, virtual lesson plans. They've been connecting with our students every day. I think our community now appreciates teachers more than ever. I myself am a parent of two children, and I'll tell you, I think teachers make us better parents. Um, and so I think it's a lesson we're all learning the hard way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, we've been getting a lot of questions about the digital divide in San Antonio. A lot of people know about you know the divide when it comes to income inequality. But this next question is this pandemic has spotlighted the digital divide in San Antonio. How has this issue impacted students in your district? So, you know, we actually had a purchase. We had already had distributed 6, 16,000 devices before the spring break, and we still had to purchase 30,000 devices. We have about just over 48,600 children. And so if you do the math, there's no district in the country that I know of that's distributed that, that high percentage of devices. We bought over 3,000 hotspots for internet access. And that was after uh, early before the break, we, we gave out the uh, uh, data plans as well as cell phones at our high schools through a grant where Lanier, we provided 70% to the high school students there. Or, and so just, you know, for me, just show me how deep the digital divide is in our community. And so we're trying to do the best to try to address it, but that's been a big challenge for our children. Yeah, and that's, that's the next question. Has it been a challenge getting students to keep contact with their teachers while distance learning is happening? You know, what's, what's been great is that we've seen 88% uh, of our students logging on. Uh, what scares me though, is we have about 2000 children and that's significantly lower from, from a few weeks ago that we haven't been able to get a hold of at all. And so that scares me because those are students that maybe families are becoming homeless as they're losing their jobs and they're maybe moving out of the community and moving with other family members. And we're just worried about them. So we're still trying to reach out to them. Are you worried at all? This is my question, not necessarily our viewers question. Are you worried there's gonna be a group of students who fall behind, who are left behind because of what happened this semester? Absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that our, even though our teachers are doing a great job and, and, and with their virtual lessons and connecting with students on Zoom meetings just like this, they, there's no replacement for, for our teachers and the relationships they've built with our children and for them to be able to be there in person with them. And so one of the plans we have is to have summer programs in July. We open our school year August 10th, and that's the plan is to open August 10th. But we want to have summer programs at least two or three weeks before that and really helping parents to ease the children back into the school buildings, especially our younger children or children with special needs, so that families can see the safety guidelines we're going to put in place. 
One of our next viewer question has to do with graduation. What are SAISD's plans for graduation ceremonies? So initially we were planning for virtual or late graduations in late July, but now because we've gotten new guidance from the governor and the state commissioner, we're actually looking to have graduations, potentially uh, outdoor graduations sometime in June. And so more information to come, we're gonna finalize plans with high school principals, uh, hopefully tomorrow and All right, obviously we're having some problems with the Zoom connection. I'm hoping I'm hoping to get it back. This happened to us at six o'clock and we got it back momentarily. So there, Oops. do we have you now? Yeah, I think so. Do you have me? Yeah, yeah, I've got you. Okay, so, so to finish your thought, you, you kind of froze up on us there at a certain point, but you yeah. are, I, uh, what I'm gathering is you are optimistic that some form of graduations may still get to happen. Absolutely, and in fact, with the new guidance from the governor, we're actually now thinking about planning for outdoor graduation. So we're going to finalize those plans with high school principals and then announce something next week. That's great. Next viewer question, what are SAISD classrooms going to look like in the fall? So first of all, know that we're going to prioritize safety. It will be a blended model so that we can achieve social distancing in the classrooms. But the goal is to really work with parents and how we work with them uh, to maybe uh, have a staged entry. So for example, shifts, uh, potentially having uh, some, you know, children coming in, you know, either alternate alternative days at certain schools. In some schools, we have the space to bring in all the children every day, uh, except that we might split the children across the building so that we can achieve social distancing. So the goal is to plan and work with parents in the month of June and really uh, get their input for the start of the school year. All right, you know we're in Texas, you know football is king. So the next question from the viewer is, will there be contact sports in the fall? Well, you know, uh, so of course UIL will, will, will drive that. And I, my, I myself am a huge supporter of sports. Uh, we've expanded our academies, academy leagues and sports programs in the last several years. And so I'm hopeful that they'll be, we'll be able to have sports. What I don't know is what UIL will require. Now, I am optimistic that, you know, the, the NFL just announced their football season. So that gives me some level of optimism. So we're, we're going to watch to see what guidance we get from UIL. And, and the hope is that we can, we can have sports. But if we can't in the first semester, I just ask our families, you know, let's be patient. And for sure, for second semester, let's be more optimistic. All right. That's all the viewer questions and the questions I have. I want to give you the floor now. What do you want our viewers to know tonight? Number one, uh, you know, we want our children to continue to have access to our summer programming and we have a great digital playground. And so we're asking parents, please, please register your children for next school year because that will allow us to allow you to have the devices over the summer as well as hotspots. And we're still distributing devices. So that's the number one thing. If you can help us with please just registering your children for next year and then just continue to work with us. We're going to reach out to you. We're here to support you. We're here to ensure to really work, you know, really be here for you in this very tough time. Great. Mr. Pedro Martinez, the superintendent of SAISD, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Take care. We'll be right back. Tomorrow morning, a new round of businesses across the state of Texas will reopen. It's the next phase in Governor Greg Abbott's plans to open the state's economy. RJ Marquez takes a look at what will be open, what restrictions will be in place, and why some are saying it may be too soon. Barbershops, nail and beauty salons, and tanning facilities. These are the kinds of businesses that will be allowed to reopen beginning Friday. On May 5th, Governor Greg Abbott announced these steps to further restart the economy, but the reopenings do come with restrictions. These businesses have to maintain social and physical distancing between customer stations. Customers in waiting areas need to maintain a six-foot distance between themselves or wait outside. Stylists and customers are also strongly encouraged to wear masks while services are being performed. Hairstylists will only be able to work with one customer at a time. 
Indoor and outdoor swimming pools are also allowed to reopen Friday, but have to operate at 25% capacity. Abbott said pools can only reopen if they are permitted to operate by the local government. San Antonio has not reopened its city pools yet. If you're missing the gym, you're going to have to wait a little longer. But Abbott announced a date for gyms and other exercise facilities to reopen. That date is May 18th. Gyms will have the same standards as other businesses. They can only reopen at 25% capacity and their showers and locker rooms have to stay closed for now. Abbott says people who use gyms should wear gloves and all equipment must be disinfected after each use. The state is still discussing how to reopen bars, which will stay closed for the time being. These plans come days after restaurants, retail stores, movie theaters, and malls were allowed to reopen with limited occupancy. Abbott had initially set May 18th as the earliest date for more reopenings, but said the outbreak has slowed to a manageable level. He warned that new infections and hospitalizations are likely to increase as restrictions are lifted. Here at home, Mayor Ron Nuremberg expressed some concern about how soon this next phase of reopenings is coming. And I think one of the challenges is we don't know the impacts of choices we make in terms of opening activities and loosening social distancing for two or three weeks after we make them. So steps taken in succession without the benefit of data to reinforce the decision is really a, a, a risk that we're taking without a whole lot of um, awareness. The governor has made it clear that his orders supersede the orders of local governments. If cases skyrocket, Abbott says restrictions could be put back into place. For the Nine, RJ Marcus. Despite some businesses reopening under the governor's newest executive order, University Hospital is reminding the public their visitation restrictions remain in place. Only visitors deemed necessary are allowed in for a patient's care. The exceptions include one to two parents or guardians for pediatric and NICU patients, one support person for labor and delivery, patients with disabilities and outpatient surgery. Two support people are allowed for critically ill patients and all visitors must pass the COVID-19 screening process before entering the hospital. Turning to tonight's top stories, already battling an outbreak of coronavirus among inmates and staff at the Bear County Jail, Sheriff Javier Salazar says he's also facing another problem, overcrowding. He says he learned last month that the Texas Department of Criminal Justice would no longer be accepting inmates from other jurisdictions because of the pandemic. We've got about 200 extra people under roof they don't necessarily belong to us, but there's nowhere else they can go at this point. Meanwhile, San Antonio City Council unanimously passing what they're calling an anti-hate resolution. Mayor Ron Nuremberg put forward the resolution, which denounces bigotry and hateful speech related to COVID-19, specifically in regards to Asians, Jews, and Pacific Islanders. The resolution language states that hate crimes, discrimination, and aggression against Asians and Jews are on the rise as those groups are being blamed for the pandemic. It's only been a few weeks since the U.S. government has admitted UFOs are real and already people are starting to see some weird things. And in San Antonio recently, people have seen a green laser light shooting up to the sky. A lot of people didn't know what it was and they thought it could have been extraterrestrial. Um, unfortunately, aliens aren't involved with this one. It's actually the Southwest uh, ISD uh, celebrating their seniors. They're gonna be moving a green laser beacon around um, around their different high schools for about a week um, each time on end uh, to celebrate their seniors uh, because it's you know it's a really weird time they're not going to be able to have their normal graduation ceremony so if you see a green light in the sky uh, you know in these next couple nights don't freak out uh, it's not an alien invasion uh, not yet at least our next story uh, on trending on ksad.com right now is actually about stinging caterpillars now, uh, stinging caterpillars are actually very common in Texas around this time of year, and they start to really come up around now. Um, unfortunately, they're uh, kind of a dangerous animal. They do cause allergic reactions. They can cause rashes. They can cause some health problems if you touch them. Uh, so general rule of thumb on this one, don't touch anything that's uh, creepy or crawly or, or anything like that. Um, maybe you can look at one from afar, but you know, if you see one on your run or on your walk, definitely don't engage. Uh, just accept nature the way it is. And our last story for trending today, uh, we're gonna stick with bugs here. Now this one, now you may have heard about the murder hornets, but 
the state of Washington is dealing with its own invasive bug uh, that's non-native and it's causing a huge problem for them. They're called gypsy moths. Now, gypsy moths have been such a big issue in Washington that the governor over there has actually already declared a state of emergency. No one knows how these bugs got to Washington, but they're a, a huge pest. They can defoliate trees very quickly. Uh, once all those leaves fall, those trees become weak. Uh, so this is something that Washington has to figure out for itself. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, it's a really weird time right now with all these crazy bugs going on. Uh, probably best to stay inside, at least I would around right now. Uh, stay safe out there, don't get stung by murder hornets, don't touch creepy caterpillars, and stay away from gypsy moths if you happen to see them. I'll see you later. Thank you so much for watching the news at 9. Take care of yourself, take care of others, and watch the night beat. Starts at 10.